Hey, this is John Feldman, and you're listening to the Voice and Verse Podcast. Hello there, and welcome to episode 18 of the Voice and Verse podcast. I'm your host, Evan Lucy, taking you through the stories behind your favorite songs. This week, I am just incredibly, incredibly thrilled to welcome to the program one of the best songwriters and producers around. His name is John Feldman. You may know him as the frontman of ska punk legends Goldfinger, but he is also an acclaimed producer helming albums for everyone from the used and story of the year to panic at the disco black veil brides and a little band that's kind of popular right now called five seconds of summer i caught up with john to talk about how he helped engineer and create the modern legacy of screamo how he wrote goldfinger's best known song and why mary poppins is influencing where he wants to grow as a songwriter so Without further ado, I hope you enjoy this great chat with Mr. John Feldman. So here I am, doing everything I can, holding on to what I have, pretending I'm a superman. I'm trying to keep the ground on my feet. It seems the world's falling down around. You have uh, had uh, a very cool thing happen recently. First, is it your first number one record with the the five sauce thing? I mean, I've had some, I've had some number ones, but I mean, not like Billboard two hundred and fifty thousand in one week, like nothing like this. This is definitely a uh, a, a first time. Yeah, it's incredible. I mean, I, I saw those guys on Monday here in DC, and just to turn around and see them playing to. 50,000 people was just, I mean, it's incredible. <laughs> yeah, dude. I mean, from where they came from, you know, from in a van in Australia to doing the shows they're doing now, it's very, uh, it's exciting, man. It's fucking, and the guys are taking it with stride and they're becoming better, better musicians every day and better, you know, better on stage. I mean, every show is a new, new level. And they had nothing but good things to say about you when I was out there in L.A. Uh, talking to them. So it sounds like you guys work really, really well together. Yeah, they're good, good humans. And uh, I have moments of being a good human, too. <laughs> well, I guess maybe we can start with that. I mean, um, what was your first impression of them when, when you started writing with them or you kind of observed the way that they were writing with other people? Like, what did you think that you... Why did you think that you would be a good fit for the project in terms of what you could help them do? Uh, I knew I could help sort of, a, you know, with arrangements and with, you know, maybe making, you know, choruses bigger and sort of, I don't know, help a little bit with, with lyric and then a, a bit with, with melody. I knew that, they're, you know, they were already really good writers on their own. I, I knew I could just kind of hyper-focus on stylistically coming from where I came from you know, growing up on the Buzzcocks and Generation X and the first wave of pop punk and it being in, being a, a quintess, quintessential part of the second wave, you know, with, you know, I toured a ton with, you know, Blink-182 and, good, you know, back, back in 94 to 97. I knew, I knew where they were coming from. Like, you know, they kind of, I mean, I guess, you know, could Charlotte all time low, maybe boys like girls would be kind of third wave pop punk and sure. this is kind of this is kind of fourth wave, I guess, you know. Um, but I just knew stylistically where they're coming from because I lived it. I mean I lived that scene. I was in a band called Family Crisis when I was in high school from like twelve to seventeen and we toured with Bad Religion in seven seconds and I mean I came from a punk rock background. So I knew I could help develop them where they already were where, where they already wanted to go and i think that gives it an authentic point of view too right it's not like you have a pop guy you're not bringing in dr luke to try to write a pop punk song you're getting somebody who knows what he's doing 
No, the band, the band knew. They knew before they had, I mean, I met them before they had management or a label, and they, they knew that that wasn't part of their journey. You know, it's not like they, it's not like they were, like, entitled, like, we don't want these, I mean, Dr. Luke's a phenomenally talented songwriter, and it's not like we don't want that. It was like, that just doesn't make sense. You know, where I think, I think that's one of, I mean, of all the ways they've kind of broke ground in this ever-changing music community, that's another way that they just stood their ground and said, these are the people we want to work with, this is what feels authentic to our band, and this is what our vision is. They had a real vision that they were going to be, that they are, that they've always been a pop-punk band. That's what they grew up on, the music they love is when they were real little, and that's what they play now. They knew that in the big picture where most kind of fucking music executive, you know, idiots to say, well, these guys write great songs, so no matter what style of music it is, let's put these great songwriters in with a pop-punk band, and it's just going to work. Yeah. Where that probably would have happened had it not been for the band being so sort of adamant about, like, this is their stance and this is their vision. Their, true, their real vision is, this is who we are. We only, wanna, we only really want to work with, with artists that come from the scene that we love. And that's what they did. Yeah. I think the last time we talked, you, you mentioned that uh, you guys started with either Long Way Home or Kiss Me, Kiss Me. But Long Way Home, I think, is my probably my favorite song on the record. It's got this like great vibe that reminds me of like late 90s pop rock, like uh, Third Eye Blind. And that kind of piano part in the beginning reminds me of Everclear is Wonderful. <laughs> um, what do you remember about about the way that one came together? Uh, it's funny, I mean, because it's like, you know, when I look back and, you know, I think about, I mean, it was so separated in the 90s, like the scenes, like, you know, Warp Tour was really one thing. It was like no effects, Pennywise, Bad Religion. It was really just that, you know, and, and they'd have, they'd have like, you know, the, the one kind of weird act kind of come on and do it. But for the most part, it was really pop punk was separated. But we did so many radio shows with Goldfinger. And I became friends with the guy from Everclear. And there really was a crossover of, like, this, like, you know, radio pop punk with, like, just pop rock, you know. And even, you know, Good Charlotte, who, you know, absolutely influenced Five Seconds of Summer, you know, their producer helping develop their sound, like Eric Valentine developing Good Charlotte sound, you know, that you could hear the Third Eye Blind influence in Good Charlotte's music. So mm -hmm. when you say you hear Third Eye Blind, it's really like, full circle from the band taking Eric Valentine's influence on, I mean, obviously because Charlotte loves Third Eye Blind as well, they, they hired Eric Valentine because of Third Eye Blind, so it all kind of, it all connects in one way or another, but like I kind of had an idea for the music and for like a hook, and like Alex got there early, you know, before, um, God, I forget who did that, that, who did that song, I want to say it was Callum and Ash, but I, I could be wrong. Who co wrote who co wrote that with, with me and Alex from All Time All Time Low. And I had like kind of music and I had a melody and Alex just said, you know, we, and we were talking, we wanted it to be kind of a nostalgic reminiscing on like, you know, kind of like a first love and, and you know, having your parents' car and the idea of just like really taking your girl out for a first day. And he said he said we will and he had the concept of like, let's take the long the long way home so we have more time to spend together. And I thought it was just, you know, brilliant. And so he had the concept, and I had kind of a melody and, and a little bit of music, and the guys just came in, and they kind of wrote, they just kind of wrote the post-chorus and the verse, and they kind of tied together, like, themes lyrically. They just wrote, that song really came together quick. Well, that's cool that you that you had. I mean, do you typically start with that concept in mind? Like, we want to do a, we want to kind of make a vignette about this, or does it ever just kind of come out? kind of stream of consciousness and then you figure out what it's about later. I think every musician that at least plays in a band or plays rock music is pretty similar that you start, like you learn an instrument, like, you know, guitar, piano or bass or whatever. And then you, and then you kind of come up with chords and then you come up with like a melody and then you come up with lyrics last. I yeah. think that's 99% of musicians I've met. That's sort of how they write music. And I, the last two years, there's actually Patrick Stump, um, and, and it's not like I've always written songs that way, but for the most part, you know, 
I have. And, you know, one out of ten, I'll have a lyric and I'll write a melody to the lyric and then music. But I did a session with Patrick, the hip-hop guy I, I was working with, Itch. And he said every song that's been a hit for him has started with a concept or a lyric first, and then a melody, and then the music. And I was like, wow, you know, because it all made sense, and I knew it. I knew it in my heart that I was the truth. So when he said it out loud in the room that day, I was like, I'm going to start writing. I'm going to start writing that way, because every song that I'd start with a concept first would always be the best song of the record, or it would just, you know, it's just the way... It's the way it should be, because ultimately, if you think about pop music or rock music or anything that has vocals, people that like buy the album or come see the shows typically are non-musicians. The musicians are going to get a, a fucking backstage pass, or they're going to you know feel the record or whatever. You know, uh, that's just kind of how musicians are. I mean, we're all we're all you know, you know, dirty thieves and liars. <laughs> you know, we, we come you know. To be in a band, you've got to have some kind of fucked up background to want to be in a band to begin with. Sure. But, you know, ultimately, people that come see you or listen to music aren't musicians for the most part. They're people that just love music and they want to sing along to your lyrics. So, I mean, even like, I mean, even the best, you know, I mean, uh, Jim Hetfield, Axl Rose, those guys were great lyricists. And, the, and part of the reason why I think those kind of, those hard rock bands here, because a lot of hard rock music is about the riff and the feeling and the lyrics are kind of secondary to it. But I think no matter what style of music is, lyrics have to be, if you're going to be singing along to a lyric and you're in the audience, you want to relate and you want to sing something that you believe is true for your life. So how is it not the starting point of every song if you're a writer? Yeah. Well, that's so cool that you were able to kind of, it's kind of been a challenge for you or it's, it's a way to challenge yourself to do something different. I was reading this interview with um, with um, Brandon Flowers from The Killers, and he said that he met uh, he met Bernie Taupin, and he asked him he asked uh, Brandon he said, "Do you like titles? Because all of the songs that Bernie Taupin writes or all the lyrics that he writes start with the title first, and then you work from there. You know, so like Mona Lisa's and Mad Hatters or Candle in the Wind, it all starts with the title, and then you build it off that, which I think is so fascinating because you see like the songs that make it big you look at the hot 100 or whatever they all have great titles yeah man i mean the concept has to come first i mean it 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 rarely does but i mean the ones that really work the concept comes first and and you know everything if if you have a title and a concept everything writes itself and the story is already there you already know the story once you have the concept so you know but it's hard you know i mean everything's been written and everything's been talked about and and how many times do you talk about being brokenhearted or (laughs) You know, I mean, it's kind of like, you know, but, but yet we still reinvent the idea of, you know, lost love or breakups or um, cheating or whatever it is that, you know, it's, you're, you're, you're going through in your life. And for me, it's like, I just, it's got, kind of got to be about personal experience. You know, I've got to have some investment in the song for me to really do a good job. I've got to have some memory of, you know, of a girl or a time or, uh, you know, some adversity that has happened for me to really kind of contribute lyrically at least, you know, musically, I, you know, whatever. But, uh, but I think he's right. I think the title is 90% a lot of the time. You don't do a lot of pop stuff these days. I think you're more, I think you said everything is either ska or it's a uh, double kick drum with screaming that comes across your desk. Most of the, most of the things. Um, but when you're working on a, a record that has a lot of different, like, people involved with different writers on different songs like how do you want how do you try to put your stamp on it but not lose touch of the band's melodic sensibilities i think a lot of times it comes you know a lot of times it comes to uh you know influences i mean when i'm when i'm influenced by the same bands that these other artists are influenced it's a lot easier to sort of connect musically and so most of the artists I work with kind of like the same kind of music or they grew up on uh, artists that I produced or my own band or whatever. And then that way, you know, it's sort of, I can, I can kind of bring my musical sensibility to what already exists. And, you know, my job as a producer is to, you know, help the band grow into whatever the next phase of their career is supposed to be. I mean, it's really like, I believe it's to be kind of, you know, part like join the band for a, a short amount of time two or three months while we're making the record to really, you know, live and breathe whoever that band is to get to know them and not, you know, clearly 
I'm not bringing a ska guitar to any <laughs> tracks I produce with the, with the EUs. It's not like, it's just like every ba- every artist is different, and I can't cookie cutter, I'm just this one guy, you know? Yeah. Because growing up, that was my biggest, my biggest issue growing up as a, as a musician was the fact that I was in a punk band, and I went to punk shows, but I loved the police. I loved Duran Duran. I mean, I loved George Michael. He's such a good writer. Mm-hmm. And I couldn't admit that out loud. I would have, you know, any time that I would say anything like that remotely, like, hey, I like this song, I could fucking beaten up, <laughs> you know, because I couldn't, I couldn't like it. So for me, like, the guy, the guy was a really diverse, you know, I went through so many musical phases of my life. I mean, I loved, you know, I love metal, I love punk, I love pop. I mean, I love new wave. It's just like, so who do I, I mean, there's, there's definitely a few things that, I, you know, I love Casey Musgrave, you know, mm-hmm. I just, because the songs are so good. I've never really been influenced by country, but she's such a phenomenal writer that it doesn't really matter what the style of music is. Like, look, if I was to produce a country record, it'd be all about the songs, and I'm going to hire the best mandolin and, and banjo players and upright bass players I can find, you know, because I can't do that. You know, so how do I make that record? I'll, I'll do, I'll, it's always about the song. That's the good news. It's like watching Aerosmith two weeks ago with the five seconds of summer dudes. It's like, like every song was a hit, and I knew every song they played. And that's, that's it. Like, you know, there were 50, 40 years into their career, whatever it is. And, and, and it's always about the song. Yeah. Well, I felt the same way when I was watching One Direction on Monday. And I'm, I'm not afraid to admit that. You just like, every song is just like, like, damn, like, that's a great song. Take away the boy band thing. Take away the fact that Simon Cowell put them together on the X Factor or whatever. These are great songs. And the song, if it's a great song, it's going to win out over all the other things that you, all the other identifiers and labels that you want to put on it. Exactly. So I don't know, man. I just feel like, you know, I started as a songwriter. I mean, I never really, I, mean, I guess I learned how to play by playing along to other people's music, but ultimately I really started writing music when I was 12 and that's what I still do today. Do you remember the very first song that you ever wrote? Of course I do. <laughs> yeah. Um, it was, uh, God, um, maybe it should have worked, uh, God, it was like, it's always, maybe it should have worked out then, but now it seems like, it's like some of like just, we were just friends and some stupid love, was like, but full on kind of Buzzcocks, Joe Jackson kind of thing. And then the second song I ever wrote is, um, I'm in love with you. It's just, it's like, I have this crazy bass line. It's like, like this crazy, like lead bass throughout the whole song lead but it was bass. like a wow, I love it. lead bass in this pop punk song anyway whatever what was the moment where you kind of felt like this was your job to write songs uh i, I still don't really I still don't really believe that i mean i guess ultimately most groups that hire me kind of want me to be involved in the writing process at least the last say, eight years of my life but I still think that, like, I make a living pushing knobs as a producer. I sure. still, in my heart of hearts, I still think that that's kind of what I do for a living. But, I mean, ultimately, like, I guess, I mean, I had an opportunity, you know, with Good Charlotte, I had a real opportunity to be, um, you know, I, mean, I remember sitting with, uh, you know, Clive Davis and his bungalow, and we were talking about, like, you know, developing Christina Aguilera and all this stuff, and I was still in the midst of Goldfinger and, like, punk rock and, all the stuff that I was doing and I just, I didn't want to, I just didn't want to go both feet in. And I was kind of like, well, if I'm not on the road, I'll write, or if I'm not, you know, touring, do whatever, like I'll, I'll produce a record. But I didn't really like until the use, I didn't really go both feet in. And I wasn't even really writing with the use, you know, in the beginning at all, you know, or story of the year. Like, so it really started, like the writing stuff, I mean, as much as I dabbled a bit, you know, 10 years ago with Hillary Duff and Ashley Simpson and Mandy Moore during the Good Charlotte kind of era, I really didn't, you know, become like a, a writer writer until I guess Panic at the Disco. I, I really started, you know, being way more involved. Was that the, the Vices and Virtues record or was that something else? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Vices and Virtues record. You know, the, the, I think I, I co-wrote like five, five songs on that record. So that was like 2011 or 10 or something like that. That was, yeah, wow. 
Yeah, so I mean, that was when I really, you know, I mean, I had written and I'd done a bunch of, like, I'd written everything for Goldfinger. I've always been the main writer. So I always knew that that was part of my thing, but I always kind of separated it, you know. I mean, I wrote with, you know, Foxy Shazam, and I mean, I definitely always kind of wrote a bit when I was producing, but it wasn't, like, full on, I don't think, until, really until, I mean, I guess after Midnight Project with Jason Evigan, I did some writing, but it wasn't really full on until... Yeah, three, four years ago, I started really having it part of my whole thing. That's crazy. Okay, so when you're in the studio and you're producing, you know, let's just say you, you're signed up and you're, and you're producing something, at what point does the, does the scale tip when you give influence that it turns into something that you have, quote-unquote, written or that you have a credit on? Well, I mean, it never really... I mean, these days, you know, I, I'm not really working with artists that don't have management, and it's always worked out beforehand. Like, we're okay. very, I'm very clear. I'm always very clear with what, what my role is going to be. The band, you know, I'll have a meeting with the band, and if they want to have them produce something, like, we already work all that stuff out. So going into it, whether I write 100% of it or whether I write one one word, it's like, it's always kind of predetermined. Okay. You know, whoever's kind of whoever's kind of in the room, we're kind of splitting it up. That makes sense. So what if you, um, I, I know a couple songs on the five seconds record you produced, but I don't think you wrote on them. Is that correct? Let me try, let me pull up the credits here. I just had them. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I helped a little bit with the writing of good girls, you know, but that song was already pretty much done by the time they brought it to me. And then like, you know, beside you was, was written. Um, I'm trying to think of what it is. There's a couple of songs I only mixed. But I mean, the bulk of the record, you know, I produced and co-wrote with them. The bulk of it, you know, I think like seven, six or seven songs were okay. co-write production, and then another three were production, and maybe two more were just mixing. Okay, so it's, so in that situation, you know, when somebody brings you a song that you're just producing that that's been written elsewhere, you know, like beside you or, or I guess it says eighteen or Good Girls, do you have to? I mean, how how faithfully do you? honor what's been written versus the way that you hear like the in the integral structure of the song like how things would be better if you did this or that is, is it tough to like not want to tear it apart and try other things with it well i always tear it apart and try to things. and that is i don't care i mean I'm, my job is to make the song the best it can be and and if that means like sometimes there are moments where i will rewrite a part but then just you know whatever's best for the song and it becomes a political thing where there isn't songwriting available or whatever. I just, I just don't take credit. It's just fine. I don't, I'm not precious about any of that stuff. I just want the song to be the best it can be. And if that requires me to, you know, rearrange a, a bridge or, you know, half time or a whole different guitar part or a rewrite, you know, you know, from the smallest of changes to the biggest of changes, it's my job to offer every idea I have and let the artist decide if it's authentic to them. Okay. Yeah, I wasn't sure. I wasn't sure if that was like something that was, uh, y you know, you don't want to step on toes or whatever. But it sounds like you're just you're just gonna go in there and get your hands dirty anyway. <laughs> I mean, they're not gonna. No one's gonna hire me to engineer a record. I mean, there's plenty of really, really great engineers slash producers that can do that. I mean, my it's not how I'm built. I'm lead singer in a band. I'm a writer. People use me to try and grow their own their own careers and hopefully to become better writers and make better records and, and use my influence to, uh, to help shape their sound into a more developed direction. I mean, that's really what I do. Mm -hmm. So the flip side of that is, has there been an instance where you've written something with someone and they go off and they, they work with another producer and then it comes out and it's just like, wow, what the hell happened here? I think every time. I mean, I think every time. I mean, I know Bush Walker's a phenomenal producer, and I think he did a, a really good job with uh, Panic's last record, but it wasn't as good as Vices and Virtues, you know, to me at least. I mean, I think it's a sound to me. I mean, you know, Bush Walker's phenomenal, and Brendan's arguably the best singer alive, <laughs> you I, know? I wouldn't disagree but, uh, with that, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's like it's a fantastic record, but, it, you know, to me, it's like there was... There's a real sound and it's in a soul to the record that I did with, 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 with Butch. And, you know, and, you know, but every other band, you know, I mean, you know, being that, you know, Panic, I don't think by not working with me is definitely not, they haven't been dropped and, and, and they're not off the face of the earth by a long shot. But there's been a lot of bands that once they kind of move on from me, 
have been dropped and then and then you know subsequently broken up and have watched it happen. You know, when I'm when some bands get as invested as they are, when I get as emotionally invested as I do, and I want them to win, and everything that I'm doing and all my decisions are based on what you know we all think is best for the project, and then you know a manager will come along that possibly manages as a producer and just thinks, oh, you know what. You know, they don't understand what a producer really does. A lot of managers aren't there in the studio watching how an album comes to comes into being, you know, and they just think, oh, it's just a matter of moving a microphone around and, like, oh, do that track, do that take again with more emotion. That's what a producer, that's all a producer does. And they say, you know, so a lot of managers will say, we're going to use this guy because they manage him. They're getting, this, they're getting a 15% commission on the band and on the producer. And then the producer just comes in, doesn't know anything about the band, doesn't care just wants a paycheck, you know, a lot of producers, you know, they're not, some aren't as passionate as others, you know, and, and I just watch, you know, albums being made that who's going to give a fuck because there's no passion put into making the record. Yeah. Have you done things like writing camps and all that kind of stuff? I've done two writing camps. I don't think I'll do it again. It's not, I'm not built for that. I did two in LA, you know, one for Kelly Clarkson and one for, uh, some artist that uh, Chris Brown had signed, and I just, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not Bill. I mean, I'm like a, I'm sort of like the, the driver. You know what I mean? Like, I like, like everyone's in the fucking boat together. Like, let me steer the ship because I always know. Like, when the band comes with me, they tell me what the direction is. It's my job to stay on course. Like, they tell me what they want the album to sound like. You know, the influences they want. You know, this is what they want in the beginning of the project, and it's my job to keep that on course. And when I go to a writing camp, it's like. I'm like some dude, like what well, you know. When, I remember bringing a guitar into that Chris Brown session, and literally they thought I was bringing a gun to the <sighs> session. They, they needed to search, search the guitar case, and I'm like, dude, it's an acoustic guitar, and they'd never seen it. Like they were so used to just like, you know, basically a, you know a pa- an iPad and like a track already built. Well, that's why I, th- you know, you you haven't done. I'm just looking at your Wikipedia discography, which I'm sure is terribly inaccurate. Um, the last pop thing I see on here is like uh, Megan and Liz, you know. So it seems like you're you're uh, you've kind of steered away from that. Yeah, it's so cool to go back and and think about um, you know the kind of whole thing that happened around 2002, 2003 with the use and story of the year and how you kind of became like the architect of that sound. I think. Um, what do you remember about what you guys? were trying to do then that hadn't been done before or just like landmark albums in the genre that they go on to inspire bands or have bands still ripping off these classic records to the day. Like, I think, uh, I mean, I never, I never look at it like it's going to be, I never look at it like that. You know, I just think like, how do I make the best album possible with these, these artists that I'm with at the moment? And that's really how we always look at it. We're never looking to say, Oh well, we can't do this sound because, like, I can't, I can't do this kind of 808 hip hop beat because Ward just did it. I just, I just do what I think is appropriate for the song, and then if it connects, it connects. And you know, you know, it's been part of like everything. It's like part of a band, tr- and mostly bands trusting me to kind of do, to be able to kind of like design sound around songs that are sometimes partly written and sometimes we do together, but it's like, you know, how do we create these things that are influenced by every artist that the band has grown up on and everything like, you know, me growing up on, you know, you uh, two and Peter Gabriel and bringing in like these different like elements and different sounds into like a style of music, like, you know, story of the year ultimately were kind of like a Chili Peppers ish band, of, you know, when I first met them, you know, goofy, jumping around like just pranksters, but they played kind of like kind of heavier music. But we really did it together in the studio, like figuring out what works and what what didn't work. And you know, I was lucky enough to have very driven, hardworking guys who were really talented at their at their instruments, and like a, you know, Dan, a singer that was a really good singer. And so, um, you know, and sonically, like I was really at that, that moment, like, you know, Screamo didn't exist. I mean, most hardcore didn't exist. It was really like, you know, I made the used record and so it was sort of like a thing that was happening that we just kind of like, we just, I was part of, you know? It's one of those things, I guess you can't, you can't engineer it. It just kind of has to happen organically because there's no, there's no blueprint for it. 
No, I mean, ultimately, like, I want to, I mean, if you had your way, you'd always be part of projects that, that are game-changing, that, that change that, like, I feel like I've been so lucky and I've been able to reinvent my, I, mean, I moved to L.A. in 1987. I was in a, um, a kind of like Chili Peppers metal band called the Electric Love Hogs, and, you know, we got signed and dropped, and I toured with Ugly Kid Joe and L.A. Guns, and I was like, that was one part of my life, you know, and then, you know, we got dropped, and I go back to work in a day job and, and, like, you know, put the whole thing together, and, like, and I was able to be part of, like, this ska, you know, really, like, the, like the origins of ska punk. I mean, Operation Ivy existed before us, but really, like, us touring with No Doubt and Real Big Fish and, you know, Buck 09 and, you know, kind of, like, that whole scene was, like, I, we were there. I was part of it. I mean, the first show I ever saw was Madness, like, kind of second with ska, and so I was there for that, but it was, like, I just loved the music. It wasn't, like, I'm going to play ska punk to be, to make money. It was, like, I just <laughs> fucking loved the music, and I just did it, and then, like, with you know, being part of that thing and then being part of, like, you know, the pop-punk culture and, like, you know, Blink-182 opening for us and signing signing Mask and working with Good Charlotte and being part of that whole thing. It was just, it just happened. I was just there and I loved the music. And then with Burt and with Story of the Year and with The Used, it was like, man, I just, I love heavy music. I mean, I love, I mean, as a kid, I love Ride the Lightning and Master of Puppets and La Pantera. And it was like, I just saw something like something melodic and pop in both those artists, like both Dirty and the Used, that just didn't exist in the heavy Ozfest world of that of that era. And so it just kind of like I just loved those styles of music. It wasn't like, hey, the world needs a melodic, hardcore, punk metal band. <laughs> <Like> <laughs> it, just, it, it already existed. I just kind of helped shape it, you know? Yeah. Well, going back to Goldfinger, the first time I ever heard uh, your voice was in uh, Tony Hawk's Pro Skater, which I think is is true for a lot of people. Um, when, when Superman was in that, and uh, still to this day, I think is just one of the quintessential ska songs ever. Um, how did that one come about? What do you remember? I guess that was, it's you know been God like twenty years ago, yeah, or yeah. Whatever, but um, what do you remember about about Superman? No. It was after our first album was done, and I wrote, uh, like, a big kind of, you know, whatever Goldfinger's version of Bohemian Rhapsody would be, like, a five-minute epic, like, different tempo changes <laughs> and different, you know, just different meter changes, the whole thing. I just kind of went ballistic, and, and what ended up happening was I, I wrote two songs. I wrote a song called Question that was on Hang Up, our second album, and I wrote Superman. And they had, I, I basically took this epic five minute song and split it into two different songs and so I didn't really think much about it at the time it was just it was all connected lyrically to me the lyrics of question and Superman were all connected but <laughs> Jay the guy that ran the label said he needed um, a, 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 like a movie or you know at the time I think we were pitching it for like some you know Trey Parker movie sure, at the time yeah. so I recorded it and you know Aaron from Real Big Fish was just there and so he sang harmonies on Superman and and we just did it next door to the studio. We did our, our full length first record out. It was going to be sort of like an in between, an in between song. And uh, it just like, I don't know. It just became what it was. And it was just one of the songs. It's my mom's favorite song we've ever done. I think lyrically, I think it just connects with the idea of growing up. And, you know, especially when you're listening, you know, and people that listen to Scott Punk are typically, you know, teenagers still. And the idea of becoming an adult and all that, it really just connects like, growing older all the time, um, you know, that whole idea connects. And Tony Hawk just took the song. I mean, I think they, I think they pitched it to, like, uh, a bunch of, uh, you know, a bunch of people. And, um, you know, pro Tony Hawk loved it. And he just, he just put it in the video game. For like, of course. I mean, like, to me, skateboarding, surfing, all go hand in hand with the whole scene and the whole movement of what I did, as, you know, from a kid till now. I mean, I, I bleached my hair because of Dwayne Peters, you know, the 80s skateboarder. I mean, mm. that was the first guy. I saw his bleach hair before I saw Billy Idol's bleach hair, you know. So, I mean, that, you know, culturally, it just made sense to be, you know, doing war tours all hand in hand. Steve Caballero would, uh, Steve Caballero would come and sing with Goldfinger every, every day when we were doing war tour in 96. So it all made perfect sense. It's 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 uh, Tony Hawk and then Crazy Taxi. I think were the two big video games that really kind of introduced me to bands like uh, Goldfinger. And then I think Crazy Taxi had 
um, all those old Offspring songs and Bad Religion as well. So um, I think my experience is not too dissimilar to a lot of the a lot of the suburban kids growing up in the uh, I guess the late '90s, early 2000s. So it's cool that things like that are able to turn people onto bands. I don't think there's much like that these days that can that can do that. Exactly. What kind of writer are you? Do you do you does everything kind of start on acoustic guitar or piano or do you get in Pro Tools and and just kind of throw stuff together or where does it start for you? Um, I mean, like I said, man, it's concept. You know, the last few years I've been I've been trying to do concept first, and then depending on the band, like clearly I can't you know doing like a halftime sort of like, you know, groove radioactive thing just wouldn't work for a band like Five Seconds in Summer, really, you know? So it's like, it depends on the artist I'm working with. I mean, I always, lately, I kind of always write with a purpose, you know? I'm never really, uh, I'm never really writing just for the sake of like, I'm going to write a Goldfinger song. I'm always kind of like, I'm always booked to kind of like, so I'm always trying to think of what, you know, what's right to this artist. But, you know, you know, there isn't a typical. Dude, sometimes I start with a bass. Sometimes I start programming on reason. Sometimes I start with singing a song to a click. Sometimes it's on piano. Like, it all depends on the song. There isn't one kind of approach I take. Which is why it doesn't just kind of sound all, like, boilerplated. <laughs> God, I hope so. I mean, you know, I think that, you know, someone told me once that, you know, all great writers write one song over and over. And, <laughs> and I think, you know, I, I see the reasoning behind that, and I see how you can you, know, you can pick anyone from, you know, Desmond Child to Paul McCartney. You can kind of see, like, okay, well, maybe they arrange songs kind of similarly, or there's, like, a, a theme or a chorus always hits within 30 seconds, whatever the rule is, like, the artist may be unaware of, the writer may be unaware of, but, you know, I uh, got a hope. I mean, I think I do have my own style that I just can't avoid from the influences that I had growing up, like the police and the Beatles being the biggest ones. But, uh, you know, I, I hope, I got, I hope there's a difference between the, the work I'm doing with Cruella versus, you know, the work I'm doing with Demi Lovato and the work I do with Black Veil Brides. I mean, I hope it's, it's different. Sure. Well, I think maybe when you're in it, it's it's hard to understand or it's hard to hear the kind of similarities or the thing that makes it your own. I I know that on that Fall Out Boy song, My Song Is Know What You Did In The Dark, I heard it and I, imme- and I immediately knew that Butch Walker produced it and, and had a hand in writing it because there's that little like, I don't know if it's the phrasing of the of the verses or or something or the the I'm on fire part in the chorus that reminds me of just something that he did like, like 20 years ago. So you can hear these little fingerprints, but it, it, it gives it a personality that comes from someone else, but it doesn't just feel like, you know, that person writing the song. So maybe there's something like that for you that I think if somebody maybe studied all the songs that you worked on, they could pick out. But, um, I don't know if it's, if it might be evident to you. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I look, like I said, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of, of music and I, uh, I study people's production. I can definitely tell the songs that Brian Eno produced on Coldplay. I know instantly that he's the producer, you know, and I, you know, I know when Eric Valentine produces things, I know when Butch produces things or writes things, you know, I, I, it's, it's, you know, we, everyone has a thing they do and I'm sure I have my own thing, which is hard for me. It's hard for me to be able to tell I'm so in it, you know, I've got blinders on. I'm, I'm just going. I just get thrown in there and I just go. I just do what I do, you know? Do you study songs? Are you an a- academic approach when it comes to songwriting? Do you break stuff down and go, why, why is this successful? Well, it's because they do this here and and that there. Nah. No? Nah, I'm just a fan. If it is something I like, I just listen and I just listen to, I just listen and try and make it, I need to feel. I mean, that's the whole thing about music and why I think that it's really difficult I think it's difficult to, to progress from a music school. I mean, at least in what I do as a writer and as a producer, I think it's hard to progress from, from going to school into that. I think you have to just experience and do it. I think that there's a, a real, there's probably a real lane for musicians, for session players, or for, for uh, touring musicians to really go to, go to school to learn how to read charts, to learn how to read or write out cheat music, like that part of it. But what I do, it's just like, Studying it is the anti, is exactly the opposite of why I do this for a living. I do this because I didn't have the, 
the brain power or the attention span to be able to sit in class. I failed out of school. I was miserable. I was horrible at school. And so for me, it's all about feeling. The only reason people listen to music is they feel something mm -hmm. different. It changes the way they feel, you know, and you can't study how to make that happen. I mean, you know, I'm sure as a non-musician, my wife could say, she could, she could pull it apart and say, well, every great pop song gets to the chorus within the first minute, and the chorus is usually a higher note than the verse, or whatever it is that you could analyze, but like people that I work with that come in and say, dude, you used that same chord in the, in the song we did yesterday. You used the D minor yesterday. Like, I never, I never want to work with those fucking idiots again. <laughs> that's not how you write. You can't write music thinking in that way. Like, if you break down every great pop song, there's probably like, you know, there's probably a structure to how the chords go because great melodies are written around really simple chords underneath it. Right. It's always about the melody. Like, like you could, like anyone could give me some fucking test and say, dude, here's four chords. For the next year, these are the only four chords you're allowed to use. And I would still come out flying colors. You know, it's not about that. It's about melody and lyric for me as a writer, you know, and clearly there are bands that don't fit in that mold, like Five Finger Death Punch probably are, are not really, you know, they're, you know, there's more riff rock and even, even bands I work with, like the Kings Romans or Black Veil Brides that don't really, you know, fall under that kind of lyric and melody category. But dude, it's the way I, I feel when I hear music that attracts me to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's, you look at somebody like, like Rivers Cuomo, who takes the opposite approach, and he famously, like, chronicled and studied every pop song that was on the radio for, like, four years, and he had them, like, all in a notebook, and and just tried to, like, deconstruct how to make the perfect pop song, and full disclosure, I haven't liked a Weezer record since Pinkerton, so maybe that's why. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> But, well, look, I think that that's the great thing about music, dude, is there are no rules. and Everyone right. has their own approach, you know? And, and I love working with all sorts of writers, so I can learn and I can grow as a writer. The cool thing about what you do that I really think is so awesome is that you get to work with so many different types of people, right? Like you have written with Ashley Simpson and Hilary Duff, but you also did stuff. You also work with the used and um, panic and, and black veil brides and everything like that. So what do you learn from other songwriters in that situation? Like people who come from different backgrounds and have different ways of approaching the creative process. Um, I think ultimately it's always about the song. And if I can play it on an acoustic guitar and sing it, you know, I think we're in good shape no matter what the band is. You know, I'm always about a big anthemic chorus or a huge kind of hook trying to come up with that. And, 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 you know, I guess, I guess in the beginning, I probably tried to, probably tried to force, you know, kind of force my my way if a band's coming to me to sort of write with, write with me. But you know, I just, I just kind of like open up, open it up. I try and like get a vibe going, try and build like a some kind of beat, some kind of guitar part that I play, and then I just try and let the artist kind of go for it, and then. You know, I say no, 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 until there's a yes, and then we try, we try and tweak, you know, tweak it until, you know, maybe I interject, you know, maybe two or three lyric or melody changes, you know, if there's a co-write. Um, you know, I, I'm way, I'm just, you know, th these days I feel like, uh, I just, I want, I want to have other people influence me as, as much as I want to influence other people. And it didn't, it didn't get away in the beginning, you know, I was, I was, uh, the singer in a band, and I just, you know, I kind of had my my agenda. And nowadays, it's kind of, it's kind of like, what can you bring? Have there been times where you know you walk away from a session, or you walk away from making a record, going, "Damn, like they approach it in a completely different way than I I would have," and I can kind of steal this idea for the next time I work with somebody else and kind of approach it in a new way. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> Nah, I, I, I just, you know, I know what I like. You know, when you're 12 and you buy your first album or 11 and, or whatever, you're, you're, you're kind of listening to music for the first time with, like, the years of an adolescent. Like, those things never, those things never change. Like, 12, 12, to 12, 12 to 18. Like, those formidable years are, you know, it's still like everything, everything goes back. And it's, it's like, look, I, you know, I go. I, I love Coldplay, but I, I just hear I, I hear U two, which was you know one of my bands as yeah. a kid. You know, and, and U two are one of my biggest. I mean, Brian Eno's the producer for both groups. You know, and 
same with like Vampire Weekend. I hear the police and I love the police. They're probably my favorite group of all time. So it's really like the bands that I re- that really formed my, you know, it was, it was Queen, Social Distortion, The Beatles, U2, um, The Police, uh, The Who, um, Buzzcocks, you know, those, those were kind of bands that I, I, I really gravitated towards. And then when I kind of got older and, and, and I got into, you know, the, the gnarlier stuff, I definitely had, you know, Rod and Lightning Master Puppets definitely influenced me. And it's like really like, um, you know, from, from Bob Marley to Metallica as a kid, that was kind of, I had a wide spectrum. And, you know, obviously Queen was so eclectic that, um, I really, you know, there's a ton of stuff that I, I still pull from, from there, from their records and from that era of music. But ultimately now it's like, I'm, I'm, I'm fully formed. I'm like an adult. And so the shit that really perked my ears up always kind of stem back from those things. Whenever someone starts like bending a string or getting shreddy or stuff <laughs> that I never like guitar solos, I never really understood unless it was like following the melody of the, of the vocal. It was never really my, my thing. So I, my brain just kind of shuts off or anything like bluesy. I never really, I never got some stones or any kind of blues. So whenever songs come out from a group that style, I, I kind of don't get it, you know? And so I always kind of push towards that big, arena rock guitar solo edge it's like the edge style guitar playing that's usually where i go to like a simple melodic you know real soaring kind of thing not too many notes so i mean it's, it is what it is you know and, and i kind of bring that sort of new wave southern california punk rock into you know everything and and it, you know it's really about the layering of stuff that changes the the style of music. I mean, it could be double kick drum with black rail brides, or it could be just straight programming for Demi Lovato. But ultimately my ears perk up when I hear a melody that reminds me of being a kid. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, you and I talked, Oh God, it must, it was so long ago at this point, whenever the, the, we are the in crowd record came out. We talked about how you, how you kind of have to play like the role of psychologist a little bit as you're, as you're getting into the heads of the, of these artists that you're working with to kind of guide them along through the, the process. I think probably more, more lyric based, but, um, do you enjoy kind of taking young bands under your wing and kind of teaching them how to do things that they had no idea how to do before they came into your studio? Yeah. I mean, I like, uh, I, I definitely like being able to help mentor for sure. I mean, it's a, it's a huge part of what I feel. And I love, I love the idea of, you know, taking a kid that has an idea or a concept and being able to help him flesh it out and kind of go, you know, go all the way with it, you know, but I mean, ultimately we want music to make you feel something. The only way it's going to make you feel something is if you're coming from a, a, a real place of, uh, you know, life experience, you know, from the heart. So that, I mean, that, that, that part comes like we talked about earlier, just like hanging out with an artist and kind of getting to know who they are. Did you have somebody like that in, in your life as you were coming up as a musician? I mean, kind of, I mean, it's got Tim Palmer produced Goldfinger third record and, you know, he, he produced and mixed Pearl Jam, Pearl Jam's first record 10. Oh wow. And so, he, you know, he also mixed that, uh, beautiful, beautiful day that you two song. Um, and so I definitely learned kind of from him, the value of like a desk and actually like splitting out, you know, when you're mixing, splitting out your stems into different, into different tracks and kind of widening your sound. And I definitely learned, you know, telephone tricks and how to mix drums and how to kind of like just vocal distortion. And I mean, he was, a, he was definitely an, an influence, but I mean, I really like, I didn't know what I was doing in the beginning, you know, 95, 96, I had no fucking clue. You know, it was like all I, I it was trial and error. I mean, it's like, I would, you know, just kind of push the faders and move the knobs and tell, hey, this sounds pretty cool. But it was like, I remember like adding a 12K shelf to a snare, like like 10 dB of 12K shelf on a snare drum. So it would just like pop, just fucking pop through the mix. And, um, and, and the guy that was kind of overseeing the album was like, how can you do this? This is, this is unethical. <laughs> and I remember just thinking, it just sounds cool. I'm like, I don't give a shit. You know, I, I didn't, I didn't really, I didn't have any boundaries or rules that I had to follow. I didn't go to school or, um, learn that way. It was just, uh, you know, it just came. We talked about and that. Over, oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, you know, over, over time, I definitely like was able to, you know, figure out which instruments take up which kind of 
you know, equalize, you know, which, which part of the spectrum, like the snare drum falls under and how, which, how we were talking about, um, you know, how, how to mix a song without getting the overheads interfering with the vocals and without getting the guitars interfering with the vocals. And, and then each, you know, each instrument has its own, its own place in that spectrum. Well, I, I asked you earlier in this conversation, you know, do you ever study songs and you go, nah, you just got to just kind of do it, you know, just let it, let it happen. So I think it's kind of the same way with the, with the way that you've figured out how to make records. I mean, in, in the beginning, I definitely studied shit. I mean, I love Daniel and I love Brian, you know, I love George Martin. It's like, I studied those guys, but studying meaning just like listen to the records I and mean, have read all the, all the Beatles books and stuff. I mean, I, I, you know, like just finding out that, you know, most of McCartney's bass was recorded through C12 was, that was interesting to me. You know, um, I like, to, I like to figure out how people made the sounds. I read Jeffrey, Jeff Emmerich's book, you know, the engineer that did all the Beatles records. So, I mean, I absolutely study music, but not, I guess, in the traditional kind of sense. I mean, I just with my ears, I just listen and then I try and imitate. And that's, that's the greatest, I mean, that's the greatest form of, form of flattery, isn't it? If you're trying, if you're imitating someone that influenced you and ultimately when I do it, when I do it for me, it never, you would never hear, um, like a nowhere man influence and in, say like a sleeping with siren song <laughs> that I'm producing ultimately, but I know it's there because I, because that's what I listened to when I was growing up. It, it's funny that you mentioned the Beatles. I was just reading this thing today, uh, in the Atlantic called the power of two. Have you seen this article? No, it's about uh, kind of breaking down the Lennon McCartney part. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. And talking. I, saw, about, I didn't read it. I yeah, saw it, yeah. It's awesome. I'll, I'll, it? I'm going to link it in the show notes so people, so people, anybody listening can um, can read it. And it, it talks about creative pairs and how like Lennon and McCartney. You know, everybody thinks that they had this great partnership. You know, they, they worked really, really well together. But part of the reason that they wrote such great songs is because they were at conflict so many times, not even just like musically, but just kind of like ideal ideologically. They came from two different places. And, and Paul was like this very uh, charming guy. And, and John by all accounts was, could, could be a little dour sometimes, but when they got in that room, like the push and the pull kind of made for kind of creative harmony in, in a way that you wouldn't necessarily uh, expect. Yeah, I think historically my band had a lot of conflicts with me and the guitar player, but I'm just, I'm too old for that shit anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I mean, you know, they say youth is wasted on youth, and I think the idea of, you know, growing up and all that drama that exists when you're a kid, um, I just think that it's necessary sometimes to figure out what you don't like, you know, and I feel like I had to go through what I went through with the guys in my band to, you know, kind of learn what's okay and what isn't okay and what my boundaries are just as a human, not even as a, as a musician. And obviously, you know, if you talk about Joe Perry and Steven Tyler or John and Paul or, um, you know, Keith and Nick, it's like historically like those are the bands that have really persevered. Although, you know, I think you two Coldplay, Red Hot Chili Peppers, I mean, if they're, if they're three of the biggest bands ever, it feels like those dudes are all pretty, I mean, from Shantae, I mean, I guess that's not true. Prashante was definitely the, I mean, I think the kind of the soul a bit to, to, to the Chili Peppers, I guess Flea is too, but really he wrote and sang so many of their, you know, big choruses and, mm-hmm. you know, he's not in the band anymore because they, they couldn't get along. So, I mean, I get, I get it in theory, but it's like, for me, it's like, I want to be, I want to be moving towards something, not like struggling to get, you know, even just to point A, I want to be able to get, go all the way and not have, not have it be a fucking disaster. <laughs> I think that's why I kind of didn't like that last Blink record because they didn't have anybody there to kind of mediate. It was just like Mark wrote his songs, Tom wrote his songs, and they didn't record them in the same room. And if you have two people that write in such different ways, you know, I think if you if you just have two sides, it doesn't really... Um, the, the, the magic is where they kind of meet in the middle and, and each songwriter is able to push the other one and they're able to elevate ideas or minimize ideas. Yeah, man, I, I, I don't think I've heard, you know, that's, that's, that's sort of the, 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 the downside a little bit to, to doing what you doing what you love most for a living is I don't really listen to like a ton of music. I'm in my car, I listen to the radio. So I feel like I'm pretty current with top 40, but ultimately like I don't sit down and listen to any new albums like I, I just heard that back to the shack that weezer song and 
on the radio and just, I was like, this is so good. <laughs> but I don't think I've heard anything off the, off the last Blink record. I mean, I'm, I'm definitely a fan of that band. Um, there's no reason I shouldn't have listened to it. I just haven't, I just haven't yet. Sure. Know? I'm sure you got the frozen soundtrack in your car going nonstop still, right? <laughs> um, I don't know. It goes back and forth. You know, it really does. I mean, I listen to a lot of satellite radio. So I'm, I listen to hits one. I listen to alternative nation and, um, you know, serious you, uh, I mean, I, I, I try and, I try and listen to stuff and I got a lot of friends that like, you know, will say, Hey, have you heard this yet? Um, you know, I like Joyce Manor. I think they're cool. Oh, absolutely. Uh, Great band. Yeah. I mean, I feel like if there's anything that's really come out that's been mind blowing, I, I'm, I'm sh- I feel like I've heard it. And, you know, uh, I, I, I feel like there's a shift again. I think it's been, what has it been, about four years since EDM kind of took over. I feel like there's a, a an organic shift happening, you know, back to, you know, acoustic, guitar-driven, and more kind of vocal. I mean, even Lord is, is, is programmed as it is. It's like it's all about the lyric and melody with her, you know? Yeah. Well, what, did you, what, was your, uh, what was your experience like at the VMAs? I know you just attended that. <laughs> I was cool. I mean, it was like I, I, I went to the VMAs, I think, about 10 years ago, and um, just kind of with Goldson, we were sort of still at, at our peak. And it was kind of a, this time I was there with, you know, another group. It wasn't mine. So it was kind of like, you know, I was kind of like a, um, a bystander to a certain extent because it was nothing, really wasn't about me. I just went to go kind of hang out with my friends. And, and it was cool. Uh, you know, ultimately, there's so much track on most of the bands kind of being played that it wasn't, it didn't feel like a concert. It just kind of felt like I, like I was really watching a TV show kind of, you know, which I guess is what it was. I'm sure it probably was awesome on TV. I mean, that Jesse J can fucking sing. She's got an unbelievable voice. Um, I don't know. I couldn't really hear Ariana Grande. I couldn't really hear her. Uh, so I only really saw like, I saw like half the show and then we bailed and we just went and got food. Nicki Minaj, man. I, I just have no words for what, what that was. It was just, uh, whew. That's all good. <laughs> I, I mean, it's, for me, it's like, we're supposed to entertain. That's the whole point. You know what I mean? It's the whole point of what we do, whether you're an actor or a musician or a performer, but you kind of, you're supposed to entertain people. And, and I, I was entertained. I mean, I think she's an unbelievable rapper and I think she's a great lyricist. So, you know, I look at it, I guess, maybe different than my mom, who was shocked, <laughs> you know, by it. But it's funny, like, when, you know, Goldfinger's old stage manager has now become a big actor. Uh, he's, he's in that show True Blood. Oh, wow. And, uh, and he, and, and you know, we, we were just uh, kind of hanging out the other day talking about just the idea of, you know, how, how what we do for a living, you know. And, and, and I remember the first time I played it was the first scene of True Blood. I'm, I'm like, Mom, check out my friend Joe. Remember him? He said, I remember Joe. And it was like he was naked and, <laughs> and fucking two, like two werewolves, like two chicks at the same time. And I was like, she's like, is he a porn star? Oh, and she God. had no no clue that it was, you know, it's, it's just funny how, I don't know, I guess living in L.A. and being, um, I don't know, just being in, in this business lo- for as long as I've been, I don't really get shocked right i mean i guess robin williams was shocking you know i guess ultimately i mean i was just talking about and he was in that that you know don't worry be happy video and yeah he was like the main guy in that video and it's like you know that's the disconnect for me is when because i'm lucky enough to be able to actually speak speak my truth i mean i think you know i think the world gets 75 percent of me and then my life gets 100 percent. i mean obviously there are things that i just don't think are appropriate with me having children to share at a, <laughs> at a global level but that shocked me you know the idea that like you know he, he had the world is his disposal for for help and that he wasn't able to talk about it and i guess i guess you know acting is very different than writing music you know and i can't i don't i can't relate you know everything that i do is like on my own terms I don't release anything that I'm not proud of or that I'm not, you know? So if I have issues, I try try and get it out of my music. Yeah. It must be tough when you, when you're essentially, you know, pretending to be someone else every, every time you, uh, you walk onto a set, it it must just be really hard to wrap your head around that. I don't know how, um, how some people do it. I I guess, uh, maybe, 
I don't know, man. I think I think uh, I think life is a struggle anyway. I mean, just like I mean, you know, eat, you know, eating and breathing and 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 exercise and and just the whole thing, like just you know, breathing in and out is you know, it's like everything takes effort. And I think uh, this world is uh, probably too much for some people. It's like a too, it's just too bright, you know. Um, and uh, it's a bummer, but I don't. God no. I mean, no one knows. No one knows why we're here, how we were created. Everyone has a bunch of guesses, but I mean, ultimately, um, I mean, that's what he cho- he made that decision as an adult. And uh, and who am I to judge anything? Because I don't know what's on the other side. If there is anything, anyway. And uh, I I know what it's like to be in pain. And then hopefully, hopefully, I um, will have enough courage if if I have, if depression ever hits that bad, then I'm able to actually really seek help. But um, ultimately, I think that people that want to be musicians and want to be in bands, for the most part, have a pretty troubled soul. You know, I don't know anyone that's really complete. You know, no one comes into my studio. It's just like, I love everything. Everything's good. There's always <laughs> something that's like wrong that they have to sing about. Yeah. Well, I think music would kind of be a, a really boring place if everybody was just really happy all the time, right? I mean, I don't think that's human nature and there has to be some, you know, for me, it's like, unless there's something to to, to strive for, I'll just give up. I've always got to look for, um, there's always going to be the next, what's next, what's the next, you know, artist or style of music or whatever, like what's the next plateau I can reach. Where do you want to push yourself as a songwriter as you move forward in your career? Someday. It's going to be scoring films and, and a musical. I mean, for sure. I mean, my, my, the reason I was in a punk rock band is because my parents wouldn't let me listen to punk rock. You know, so <laughs> they uh, they only let me listen to um, they only let me listen to musicals growing up. It's all like I talked about earlier. It's all sound of music and a music band in Oklahoma and Mary Poppins and and so you know I've come full circle now that I'm a dad and I'm like a grown up and I get the I get how um, detailed and how difficult it would be to, to, to go start to finish. Like even the movie Once or Quadrophenia or Tommy or any of the great rock kind of musicals, it's just like I'm writing song to song. I'm never writing like a full hour and a half, two hour sort of concept, which is uh, exciting to me. At some point I'll be doing that. Have you ever tried to do a concept record? Um, we did on Wretched and Vine a bit with Black... Cocktail Brides. I mean, I think that that was kind of as close. I mean, the last used record, um, the uh, Imaginary Enemies. I mean, I think that Bert really had a lyrical concept that, that was through that went throughout the whole album. But um, but I don't know. I mean, not like yeah, not like Tommy or Quadrophenia. Yeah, I thought the last used record was awesome. By the way, you guys did a great job on that. Yeah, thank you. I think we really pushed the boundaries. You know, I mean. To me, it's really Bert's, you know, Bert's voice and Quinn's guitar playing that that always uh, makes them to use. No matter what I'm doing pro- in programming world or whatever melodies or lyrics him and I are writing together, it's always the, the tone of his voice and the tone of the guitar that makes them to use to me. Well, it's just great to see that they've been at it so long. And, and I think a lot of bands, especially kind of the ones that they came up with, after as many years as they've been doing, they just kind of sound stale and kind of neutered. But there's a there's kind of a, a, a an anger and an energy on that record that I think is so cool to see so many years into their career. Yeah, Bert's definitely angry. <laughs> <laughs> um, where can people find out more about you and all the stuff that you go on? You've got going on. Go ahead and and plug whatever you'd like. Um, I think there's a thing called Google and my name has two ends at the, at the end. Feldman and Feldman and <laughs> Feldman. And. So yeah, just whatever. I mean, <laughs> you can find out anything you want about me. I don't, I don't think there's any naked pictures of me, but anything else is out there. Man, that was so awesome. A huge thank you to John for, uh, for chatting. Great stories. Great guy. Great producer. He's got some great records coming down the pipeline. So stay up to date with him. Go to the Google thing that he talked about and type his name in, or you can find him conveniently on Twitter at John Feldy. All of his uh, info will also be linked on this week's show page, which you can find over at voiceandversepodcast.com, along with all the ways you can stay in touch with us. Facebook at facebook.com slash voiceandversepodcast, and Twitter at voiceversepod. 
You can subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube. So go there. Make sure you never miss an episode. Leave a nice review, comment, tell your friends, and then come back in two weeks for another episode of the Voice and Verse podcast when we uncover more of the stories behind your favorite songs. Thank you so much for listening, and we will see you soon.